There we go. All set. All right. Uh, so good evening, everybody. Uh, as Becky said, my name is Carter. Uh, today, I'm going to be talking mostly about monarchs and milkweed, but I will mention the organization that I'm from, which is called the Mersey Tobiotic Research Institute, or MTRI for short. First of all, I wanted to give a little background to who, who am I. <laughs> um, so I'm Carter. I went to Acadia. I did my bachelor's and master's at Acadia. I actually did my master's in reptile research. So I am actually a reptile researcher by trade, and uh, I usually work with snakes and turtles mostly, but uh, I actually dabble a little bit in butterflies, mainly the monarch butterfly. So MTRI, I wanted to talk a little bit about them before moving too much into detail about butterflies. So MTRI has a mission to promote sustainable use of natural resources and biodiversity conservation in the Southwest Nova biosphere and beyond through research, education, and operation of the field station. And we have a really big vision as well. And both of these things are pretty big and wordy and they're nice, but what they really mean is that we want to live in a world where both humans and nature can live cohesively and sustainably, and we can kind of have like, you know, big happy family style. <laughs> We want to live in a world where there are no species at risk. We do a lot of things. Um, mainly, we do a lot of research. So a lot of my time goes into actively going out and looking for species at risk, tallying how many I see, recording data, and making sure they're doing OK, and mostly things to do with that. That could be the form of actually going out in the field, recording that data, or sitting at home, analyzing the data to try and come up with some uh, a model to see how they're doing, that kind of thing. We do a ton of volunteer engagement. We always like encourage and welcome volunteers to come out with us to experience what we experience, to see the work we do, to get to know Nova Scotia better and our species better. Uh, we do things like bat surveys where you can come out and count bats with us or nesting surveys, which this month june is a very important month for rep for turtles in particular because they are up in the evenings trying to nest this is often in areas that are dangerous like roadsides so we like to take people out and that program would not be possible without having that volunteer crew we've had thousands and thousands and thousands of hours uh, dedicated to helping protect turtles nests and making sure that those uh, eggs get uh, are not predated. Some of the other things we do are outreach and education. So this could be in the form of going to markets and having booths, going to a targeted events and hosting booths like Hope for Wildlife Open House. We go and talk about the different species at risk or seminars like this one or presentations to specific groups. Um, we also take out school groups and have workshops so we've had workshops on various topics in the past. Um, the picture in the middle there, you can see we've taken out the local land-based learning class. So we got them out in the community working on species at risk. We also produce uh, lots of literature. So species at risk guide, healthy wetland guides. These are resources for landowners uh, and the general public to use to learn more about these species at risk. And various other topics, FSC, invasive species. We have a whole list of literature and you're always welcome to come to MTRI to check out some of the stuff we have. The main, or the, I guess my main job is uh, working with species at risk. So MTRI not only works with monarch butterflies, but bats, as well as lichen, hemlocks with the hemlock woolly adelgid, Eastern ribbon snakes, blandings turtles, and then we have a few other projects that always escape me because <laughs> I never get to work on them, like old growth forests. Today, of course, we're going to be focusing on the monarch butterfly. But if there's ever anybody has questions about any of the other species, you can always reach out to me or I'm try and we'll direct you to the person who knows the most about those subjects. So the monarch butterfly, for those who might not have ever seen one, is a very large orange and black butterfly with white spots. Uh, they consume 
milkweed as a caterpillar. So milkweed is their host plant. They have one of the largest insect migration routes in the world. And some of the threats that they're facing are a loss of overwintering habitat, um, the use of pesticides and herbicides, and a loss of breeding habitat, so a loss of milkweed. In uh, Nova Scotia, you might see another butterfly that looks similar to a monarch. This one is called the Viceroy, and it mimics the monarch. And that is because the monarch is actually um, poisonous. So if you ingest it, you're going to get really sick. So the Viceroy is trying to tag along on that uh, on that strategy and pretend it's the monarch. So other things think it's also poisonous. And that's why they're brightly colored. Usually brightly colored animals or plants or things are usually poisonous, so you don't want to eat them. The difference between the viceroy and the monarch is this lateral line on the hind wing. So if you look, there's a vein that runs, there's two veins, one on each hind wing that runs directly across the wing, kind of cutting the rest of the veins in half. If you see that, that means that's the viceroy. The viceroy is also quite a bit smaller than the monarch, as you see on the bottom left photo. But unless you have a viceroy and a monarch side by side, it's going to be really hard to tell. So looking for that lateral line is your best bet. You can also tell if a monarch is a female or male based on looking at it. Males have these two scent glands on the hind wings indicated by the red arrows here. Those are used to attract a female. The females do not have those scent glands, and the black veins on their wings are also quite a bit thicker. So sometimes it can kind of be a little bit difficult to tell a female because I find it just so easy and obvious when I see the scent glands to know it's a male versus the female, you kind of get to get a little closer to make sure that there is no scent gland. You might also see a female actually laying eggs on a milkweed, then you'll know it is a female. Monarchs go through a really cool life cycle that's a bit obscure. Uh, so the way that their, the, their life cycle goes is in uh, around March, they start to wake up from their overwintering site and they'll begin to breed. Those ones that have bred will lay their eggs and then pass, they'll die. The first generation will grow up They'll go through the full stage, they'll through caterpillar, they'll pupate, and then they'll emerge as adults. They'll begin migrating north. And they continue to do this as they lay eggs and the generations go through. So by the third generation, they're in the furthest north that they're going to be. So the northern limit of milkweed, so which is Nova Scotia and kind of like half, if you cut Ontario in half, right about there, that's about the northern limit. So they'll be up to here. Then what happens is they kind of have a choice and it depends on the weather. So if it's still warm, it's still sunny, they still got time left in summer, they may breed again and lay eggs and die. And then the fourth generation or fifth generation will actually be the one to migrate south. They wait for that cue of the cold temperatures and the shorter days to kind of clue in that it's time to get going south, just like the birds. The only difference is it actually changes which generation will make the migration. Those cold temperatures will cue them to go through a change where they'll dedicate more resources to, into flight muscles and begin that journey south. And then they, the monarchs that are born here will make the full three or the full 5,000 kilometer hike down to Mexico in one go versus the three or four generations it takes to get to Nova Scotia, which is a really crazy life cycle. <laughs> and it's not always the same skipping of generations. It might be the fourth, it might be the fifth. It depends on how long the summer is and the temperatures, which is just absolutely mind boggling to me. And once the whole thing is over, they've returned to Mexico, they'll go to sleep, and then they'll spend the winter there, they'll wake up in spring, breed, start the whole cycle over again. The other really crazy factor in this all is the generations that are 
migrating north only live a few weeks. The one that actually makes the migration back to Mexico in one trip can live six to eight months. So it's a huge difference in these butterflies. The overwintering site, uh, I mentioned a few times now, is a very special site in Mexico. They overwinter in the Omile fir forest in Mexico, and uh, there's a, they're under threat, the, the forests themselves. There are very few Omile fir forests left. They're being illegally logged, sadly, and it's diminishing the amount of habitat that the butterflies have to overwinter in. And the more it's logged, the worse it gets because as they lose area, they actually lose the buffer that helps protect them from storms and, and bad weather. So the less area they have, the, and if there's any storms, the more are likely to die, which is really sad. Thankfully, there's nice big sanctuaries and stuff, and they're still, they are protecting that forest. The way that they measure the population to kind of keep an eye on it to see how it's doing is actually by the number of hectares that the butterflies cover, the number of trees that the butterflies cover in the overwintering site. This obviously is not an exact science, but it, it's the best way instead of counting individuals, which would take literally forever. Um, you can see historically they've covered up to 20, almost 20 hectares of trees in Mexico. And sadly, in 2014, had the lowest recorded number of, they didn't even cover a full hectare, just a little over half a hectare of trees. Since then, they've actually come up in numbers and they've started to cover a little bit more. And they've determined that they would like to see an average of six hectares per year covered by butterflies to say that they are doing better. They haven't updated this in a couple of years now. So I have no idea how they're doing in the last few years. Here I show the migration path. The, the blue star in the bottom is the overwintering site. And you can see sort of the migration path northward and the northern range of the milkweed. There's something in the middle there called the corn belt. And that's a bit of an issue. It's a large areas of agricultural land that are lacking in both milkweed and nectar sources. And this is where that pesticide and herbicide use becomes a problem because they use it to try and keep the weeds out of their agricultural lands, obviously, but they also are inadvertently affecting the monarchs because they're, well, milkweed, weed is in the name. So there's not enough milkweed for the monarchs there. Now I wanna talk a little bit about the life cycle, the more specific life cycle of the butterflies. So monarchs will come look for milkweed and the females will look for it visually and then they can confirm what it is by actually tasting it with their feet. They'll lay usually one egg per plant, sometimes more, but usually one. A female can lay up to 250 eggs in total. So she needs to find a lot of milkweed that egg will hatch in a few days into a tiny, tiny caterpillar. The picture there of the little caterpillars, you can see my thumb in the background, so you can almost see my fingerprints. So you can kind of get an idea of how tiny these guys are. They're only, they're not even a centimeter long and they don't really have any color. They're just kind of white with black stripes. They begin to chew the leaves and they, make these crescent cuts to stop the, the sap from flowing through so they don't get overwhelmed because there's actually a latex in that sap that can kill them. The latex in the plant and the poison in the plant is the plant's defense from being eaten. And the monarchs have actually capitalized on that by using it for themselves as their own defense mechanism. They'll continue to eat and they'll go through five sheds or five stages, which we call instars. The first one being very, very tiny. As they grow, they'll shed their skin into, and they'll get a little bit bigger until they get to the point where they're uh, like a couple inches long and really fat. Like they're very big, super obvious. I have a couple pictures later on. Once they reach that stage, they'll wander away, they'll find a safe place, and they'll hang upside down in the 
the typical pose that we call the J pose. So they'll do a little sit up. This is when they're getting ready to go into their chrysalis. They'll shed one more time revealing the chrysalis underneath. And after about two weeks, the chrysalis will begin to turn black and it's actually cl becoming clear and you're beginning to see the abdomen of the butterfly. Soon the butterfly will actually emerge looking very weird and they'll have to hang upside down and they'll have a really enormous abdomen and really tiny crinkly wings. And that's because all the fluid that they need to go into their wings is actually still in their abdomen. So they'll sit upside down and let that fluid flow in to their wings and gently flap their wings, drying them out and getting those slight muscles warmed up before they get, then they'll take off and then they'll start feeding on nectar plants. Here you can kind of see on the left how tiny these little itty bitty caterpillars are. So if you're looking for monarch caterpillars, it's almost easier to find the cuts, the crescent cuts in the leaves first. On the right, you can see the large caterpillar. So he's like a couple inches long. He's pretty fat. He's about the size of your thumb. And in the background, you can actually see these black dots. So that's their poop. And that's probably the easiest thing to spot. And it gets it's easy to see once you're looking for them. So those are signs to look for when you're looking for uh, caterpillars on your milkweed. So milkweed or members of the Asclepiaceae family. So the, if you're looking for milkweed plants, you want Asclepiaceae. Are a it's actually a poisonous plant. So in the sap of the plant is a carcinogenic, and the caterpillars consume that and store it in their bodies so that they become toxic to anything that tries to eat them. Unfortunately, predators need to eat them to learn that they are poisonous. And that's why they're brightly colored. It's a learned trait. After so many times of eating those yellow and black caterpillars, the birds start thinking, okay, those ones don't taste good. No more of those. So the less there are around, the less they learn. So it's really important for, for species like this to have high numbers. So there are a couple different species of milkweed in Nova Scotia that you might come across. I'll show you those. And there's some issues with milkweed. So in Nova Scotia, you might see in the valley, you're more common to see the calm milkweed, which has fat, thick, fuzzy leaves and a pretty round uh, ball of flowers on the top. Swamp milkweed, like its name, usually grows in more swampy areas along lake shores and riverbeds. It has a thinner, more luscious green, smooth leaf and more umbel shape, a more umbrella shaped flower complex. And the other one you might see is butterfly weed or tropical milkweed or orange butterfly weed. This one has many names. Um, it's sold in nurseries mostly, and it's orange, and it doesn't grow here natively. The other two species do. So if you're ever thinking about getting milkweed, swamp milkweed's the one you want because it's native and it's not an aggressive plant. Common milkweed actually reproduces through root shoots, because so it can take over an area pretty quick, causing it to be a bit of an issue for certain areas. So milkweed because of the carcinogenic in its sap and the latex is an issue. It's a, it's a carcinogenic, so it's toxic to livestock. It can be really deadly to poultry too. Because of the latex in the sap, it can clog up farm equipment. And it because it loves these open areas, the common milkweed in particular, it can really invade croplands. So in that corn belt, that's where it becomes a huge issue. If you're trying to harvest your crop and you're getting all this milkweed caught up in your in the mowers, it's going to become an issue, especially if you're trying to make like hay for horses and things. You don't want milkweed in there because that's bad for it's toxic to them. In Nova Scotia, common milkweed is on the noxious weed list currently, but because of its importance to the monarch, there um, the recovery team is currently trying to get it removed from that noxious weed list. The other thing that I wanted to throw in here is there is an invasive Asclepia species called European Swallowwort or dog strangling vine. It is part of the Asclepia or milkweed family, but unfortunately monarchs cannot survive on it. But because it's 
it's similar and they think it it's gives them all the same cues they'll lay their eggs on it but they won't survive there's not very many sighting reports of this so i don't think it's a huge scary issue but it should it's good to be aware of all these invasive species so a few years ago uh, monarchs were actually listed as endangered in nova scotia so what this means is some good things some kind of annoying things um, you now need a permit to handle them, so that means you're not allowed to move them or anything with them without a permit. But what this means is they're actually protected, so it means nobody can hurt them on purpose or try to move them and do anything on safe with them. So it gives them protection by law, which is really nice. We want these guys to be safe. Um, we're still raising awareness about this and some of the new studies that have come out. Uh, there's been a lot more new studies looking into monarchs because of their status and because they're at risk. You can still order monarchs online and ship them in, which is a scary bad thing um, because some places that raise monarchs don't do it properly. They, they're too close together. They might have diseases or bad genes or carry parasites like OE, like OE which is, I can't pronounce the word owl, but it's a, an infection of a protozoan that they can have and pass on through touch. And if they get too much of this overloaded with it, they become deformed and they can't fly and they're no longer able to make it to Mexico. So I talk a big game about monarchs. What am I doing about it? So we started a few years ago, the Milkweed Monitoring Project. So. I do a lot of monitoring in all my other projects. We haven't, we hadn't been doing it with monarchs. So we decided we were gonna start trying to monitor monarchs in Nova Scotia, see how they're doing. We wanna look at like the loss of habitat. What kind of habitat is there? Is there enough food for them in Nova Scotia? Are there any threats that are in Nova Scotia that aren't being considered to them overall? And do they have any preferences? Like, is there something that they like more than other things? Are they being attracted to places they shouldn't be? Is there a safe space that they could be attracted to away from dangerous sites? So on and so forth. So we came up with this data sheet. So for each site, we would record the, who was out, the date, where it is, and details about the area. Where is it? How big is the patch? what species are there, how many stems are in the patch, how much of the patch was eaten, and then however many um, monarchs. So we recorded herbivory and condition of the patch. So we, how much of the patch was actually consumed, so how much of it was chewed up, because we're concerned about overeating patches. So monarchs might be attracted to little, small patches that can't actually sustain a lot of monarchs. So we recorded the percentage of the patch that was eaten to kind of get an idea if that's a huge issue or not. And also the condition of the patch to see if monarchs have a preference for greener patches or if they don't really care if it's green, if it's old and dying, if they're just like whatever, it's food. And also recording any threats we saw. We did see a lot of predators, Sometimes there was roads nearby that could be dangerous for road mortality or anything that we thought prevalent. So the methods for this, we would actually go to each patch and we would survey a hundred stems from that patch or if there was less than hundred, we'd do the whole thing. We would carefully flip up the leaves of a hundred, the hundred stems and look for caterpillars and eggs and we would record everything we saw and we would try to record the instar as well if we could figure it out just to get an idea of like how much is this being used how many generations are using it and the method would be repeated in three weeks and then that way we wouldn't accidentally double count uh, caterpillars we were able to survey 29 patches last year so nine of those were cultivated or garden patches, 20 of them were wild patches. Here you can see the general map of where we surveyed. We tried to get a good variety 
Um, we're hoping to get even more variety this year. <laughs> Uh, the size of the patch represents the relative size of the, or sorry, the size of the circle represents the relative size of the patch we surveyed, and the yellow represents how many caterpillars or chrysalises we found, or eggs. I looked at a few things rather quickly, just the estimated abundance. So this is just the total number of juveniles in the 100 stems multiplied by the total number of stems we estimated there to get an idea of how many juveniles might be in that patch. And generally, the most we've seen were in a cultivated patch, but that was somebody who has a really green thumb and has really nice plants and has all the nectar plants that you could ever imagine. So I'm not surprised she had a ton of caterpillars. But overall, nothing really jumping out at us as saying like they have a preference for cultivated or wild patches. We also looked at the condition. Um, nothing super obvious. It kind of looks like they might not like those 80% uh, group, which are the more yellowing patches. Um, but there's not a ton of data here to really make any strong assumptions yet. The next step for that project is to continue this next year or this coming year to compare, maybe revisit some sites to see if there's a difference annually between sites, um, to see if we're seeing a difference this year compared to last year in numbers, and also visit more sites across the province to get an idea and be able to make more assumptions about the differences between patches. Now I want to talk a little bit about how you can be more involved. So I want to talk about pollinator habitat. So monarchs need nectar, just like many other pollinators. So this information is good for any insects, really. So the best way to start is actually having a pollinator garden in your yard. Best way to start is to choose a location and try to get two plants that flower in each season. So two that flower in spring, two that flower in summer, and then two that flower in fall. And that's a great way to start. Some key features you might want to include in this pollinator garden are obviously food for the pollinators, water for the pollinators, and shelter. So food is a pretty key thing. We need that all the time. So, so here's a couple of examples of some plants that flower in each of these categories. Um, the spring being the most important time, a lot of the pollinators are just coming out of hibernation. They've used up all their fat reserves and they need something to eat to replenish, to get going, to get started for the year. So these ones are the most important really. And they're also the hardest to find. It's extremely hard to find plants that flower in spring. So. The more you find, the better. A couple of our native species that I like to point out are like boneset, joe pieweed, um, and goldenrod are really good ones. And goldenrod is a really, it gets a bad rap, but it is a really good plant. It has lots of flowers on it. It's very easy to grow. It can grow just about anywhere. And uh, it doesn't cause the allergies as much as ragweed. Ragweed's the key one at playing the role in the allergies. So poor goldenrod just got a bad rep with it. Sequential blooms are absolutely perfect for gardens. Why? Because there's always continuous nectar sources for those pollinators. So things like butterfly bush on the far left here are really great. Obviously the butterflies love them. There's always flowers blooming for them and they're relatively large steeples. So there's a, you get a really long bloom time out of one plant versus a plant that has a singular bloom that will maybe come out for a few days or a week and then die off. These guys constantly have some flowers. Other food sources you might want to consider are things like food for yourself, like you can have a treat too. So blueberries, raspberries, staghorn sumac makes a great tea, um, service berry. Grasses are really good too. I know I innately think I don't want grass in my garden because you're not supposed to, but grasses are great. Uh, sweet grasses, switched grasses. These are great 
not only for nest building materials, but also places for pollinators and butterflies to get out of the rain and seek shelter. And also host specific plants, things like milkweed for the monarchs or thistles or pearly everlastings for the painted ladies and things like that. Other key features, so water and safe water. Safe water is the key feature here. So what do I mean by safe water? I mean like spaces that pollinators like bees can go get a drink without falling in and drowning. So often if you leave a bucket of water outside, you see a bunch of bees floating in it. And it's because they tried to get a drink out of the side of the bucket and they couldn't hold on because it's slippery and they fell in. So some things you can do instead are adding um, little rock waterers like on the far left corner there. It's just a little, a potting tray or a little dish from a plant pot with some rocks and water. The bees and butterflies can sit on the rocks and get a drink safely because there's grip on those rocks. Something else you might consider adding is uh, these rocks with all the little holes and dents in it. They can fill with water. You might have to water them sometimes because the holes are really small, but then they can get a drink out of those holes. You might also consider adding a puddling station for butterflies. So butterflies can't actually get everything they need from nectar. Sometimes they need to get minerals. And that's when you'll see them puddling, which is this behavior when butterflies gather in the middle of a road around a puddle and they start drinking the water from the puddle. It's because they're trying to get those minerals that have soaked into the water from the road. The way to do this is to have a dish with some soil in it and rocks and water and basically the minerals will soak into the water and they can get a drink that's mineral full. And lastly, some shelter. So these are areas for the insects to get out of the rain and bad weather and hide out. So grasses, like you see, or bee houses, uh, places for the bees that are made specifically for the bees to get in out of the rain or rock wall features or any features that provide an area that's dry that they can get in out of the rain and weather. These could be even decorations like trellises or benches or other features that you let the plants grow up. This provides a space for them to get in out of the rain and it also looks really pretty. So the, you know, don't be afraid of those vertical spaces and utilizing them. You might have a few other visitors to your garden. And although I'm no entomologist, uh, I wanted to mention a few of them, like on the far right, the firefly. I see these guys all the time. They're really cute. Um, the top middle one here, this is a spine soldier bug. Um, they actually predate monarchs. So you might not want them in your garden if you're trying to get monarchs to come, but you might see those guys around. On the left is a hummingbird moth. These guys are really cool. They look just like a hummingbird, but they're actually a moth. Or ladybugs and all various bees. And I also wanted to add that not all bees look like your traditional bumblebee. These are all different types of bees that you might see in your garden. And there are hundreds of species of bees in Nova Scotia. So you might see any mass variety of bees. And you don't have to have a large space to have a garden either. Um, I live in a very small apartment. So the top right is actually my solution. I have this planter that I've just let grow a little wild with different flowers. The bees love it, they'll come over. Um, you can also use, like again, you can take advantage of these vertical spaces. Um, things like old shoe racks can be converted into great spaces for flowers or annuals or your herbs if you like, and you can hang those up. Old pallets, they're always being thrown out. Top left, uh, old cement blocks. I like this one if it was uh, tied in with, you can actually paint with moss. So you blend up moss with yogurt and you can paint it on and it will grow and then you'll give it a much more natural look or old furniture or old bathtubs, boots. I've seen people turn just about anything into different plant potters. A few more ideas. Some of these, I like to take advantage of these vertical spaces because they're so underutilized. On the far right, these are actually PVC tubes that have holes cut in them and the plants are planted into the holes. 
And finally, um, my absolute favorite is that top right one where they took an old tire and turned it into a little pond. So this incorporates plants, safe water, drinking spaces, and shelter that they can get in on the edges and hide out of the rain. So this is a really good like trio of things right there. Where can you find some plants? So we actually partner with nurseries across the province. Um, we provide them with milkweed seeds so that they can continue to grow it and sell it for people across the province that wanna be more involved. We have partnered with Indian Farm Gardens, Wildville, uh, Wiles Lake Farm Market, Village Nursery, Jefferson's Greenhouse, Helping Nature Heal, and many more. These are just some of the ones that are local to us in the South Shore. And that concludes my presentation. Are there any questions? Thanks so much, Carter. Yeah, folks, if you have questions, you can speak up now. You can stick them in the chat. I can get us started off if you want to think about your question or you need time to, to write it down. Uh, I do have a whole bunch of questions for you, Carter, because I'm super interested in monarchs and plants. So I apologize in advance. I'm super excited. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm wondering first about um, the configuration of gardens, where I, I'm anticipating that a lot of folks who are into monarchs are probably also at least a little bit into gardening. I've seen research suggesting that maybe the best configuration of a pollinator garden for monarchs is one where the milkweed are kind of out to the edges rather than inside a wide garden, perhaps to avoid predation. Do you have any knowledge, thoughts on that, or have you seen any thoughts work on that in Nova Scotia or, or Atlantic Canada? Um, so I know exactly the paper, Baker and Potter, 2019. It was uh, milkweed along the outside of the garden was two to four times more likely to be visited by monarchs. Um, I don't think it was, I don't think there was anything about predation in that particular one, but uh, there's a few different papers that all say a little different variation of what's the best. So if you wanna be really specific, you need to have open south north access to the milkweed. It's actually better to have your milkweed away from your other plants as well, because you might be attracting predators in to your milkweed patch. So even having the milkweed away is even better. Um, and not having your milkweed near structures like houses that paper wasps would use and definitely no butterfly houses because paper wasps use them 100% of the time in the one study and they predate on monarchs. And having more than one species of milkweed too. I think that was like six different papers all together <laughs> summarized in three seconds. Great. Uh, well, Brooke has a similar question, which is how many milkweed should you have? And I, I guess maybe another question that's related to that is, should they be like clumped or should you have like a bunch of individual plants scattered all over the place or both? So then there is no magic number. And I think that's a bit of a, a little bit of a debate right now about how many milkweed you need to have a good patch. Um, I think having several well-established plants is a good start. So ones that are self-seeding, once your plant is established and, and uh, going to seed pod, uh, it will actually continue to have more and more stems each year. So you'll get like almost a milkweed bush. Um, once you have a couple of those, you're looking pretty good. Um, and I'm not sure, I don't think there was anything about having uh, more than one patch of milkweed. I think that, yeah, I, I never read anything about that one. I don't think it makes too much of a difference whether as long as each area has enough that the caterpillars that are there won't run out of food or if at least the caterpillars can travel it's not far a super far difference the distance that they can actually travel to another patch if they need more food okay makes sense and what about um you mentioned uh, it's beneficial to have a couple of different species what about differences between cultivars? Are you aware? Because a lot of like swamp milkweed at the garden centers is different colors, different cultivars of swamp milkweed. Are you aware of any important differences between those in preference amongst the caterpillars or success in yeah, getting to adulthood? 
So there is there was a study that compared the different species of milkweed, and they are not all equal. Swamp milkweed and common milkweed were actually one of the higher ranking in survival and preference. Um, there's, I think, like a dozen other species that, of course, we don't have here. They grow in the States, so it's good that we have the two best, um, but it didn't look at the different cultivars. I, It's interesting because a lot of those didn't exist recent, until recently, like ballerina, um, which is the white variety of swamp milkweed. And I would assume, but I, I say that hesitantly, that the properties would still be the same, but when you start breeding um, colors and stuff in plants, it might have an effect on the actual levels of that carcinogenic that's in the plant that helps them become the butterflies be poisonous. So I'd say stick with your naturals and supplement with the pretty ones. <laughs> And those um those nurseries you guys partner with are they good for finding like wild stock? We provide with wild stock, yeah. So we uh, MTRI has its own patch of milkweed, and we also have a few people that send us milkweed. Those are all from uh, natural Nova Scotia grown milkweed. I've definitely found in my on my own property where. I've got mostly swamp milkweed kind of like all over the place. And then a couple pots that are up on my deck of both swamp milkweed and common milkweed that I find more caterpillars every year on the, the potted plants that are kind of out on their own, but also on the common milkweed throughout the year. I'm assuming that's because the common milkweed is bigger most years. And so it's providing more food or more food throughout the year, perhaps. But I'm wondering why there are more caterpillars in the pots versus in my really bulky messy garden is that maybe because of predators or maybe the adults aren't going to that area I've definitely read that before that they in in, in the and in our study, we found a lot of the caterpillars were actually on the edges of patches rather than in the interior. And it might have to do with access to the plant and actually the butterfly finding the plants. They might not be able to see them in the big patch of everything else. And that's probably why they like the, the milkweed along the edge of a garden instead is because they can actually find it. <laughs> So I, I would guess that's why they like being able to, they, it's like, oh, yep, there's milkweed, done. Gotcha. Okay. Well, I really like that white variety of the swamp milkweed, and there's a yellow one that I've been trying to get my hands on for a while. I wonder if we should be asking people to tell us how many caterpillars they're seeing on their white versus pink milkweed. I'd be interested in that. Me too. Um. I had a question about uh, species. You showed uh, three species earlier in your presentation, um, common swamp and uh, butterfly weed, I think, but you also mentioned tropical milkweed. Can you take us back to that maybe, or talk about tropical milkweed versus um, butterfly weed, both, I think both of which are orange or similar? So it, it's actually the same species. It just has a bunch of names. Oh, there it is. So in the store, you might see this by a bunch of different names. So I just wanted to mention a few in case you're familiar with one, but not the other. So it's, uh, I think it's called butterfly weed, but it's also called tropical milkweed, or you might see it by a few other orange milkweed or orange butterfly weed. This, the scientific name being Asclepias tuberosa. So if you're looking for this variety or you're not sure what the variety is you're looking at, it's best to go with the scientific name because that should be the correct um, non-arguable name versus some of the common names get confusing. Like even swamp milkweed now, I'm seeing it as uh, red milkweed or red butterfly weed. So it's go it's just there's so many names and especially of the varieties it's easier to look at that scientific name so if it's tuberosa it's the tropical one and it's less preferred okay interesting yeah because i have i have some kind of orange milkweed in my garden that's one of my favorites actually and i've never found it to be particularly weedy um has that has a species name changed recently i'm wondering because i know that there's also 
um, Asclepius curasavia, Kur curasavica, which is also called tropical milkweed and is orange. And I, oh, that's I'm another not, one entirely. Yeah, well, I'm not sure if that one has been spotted in Nova Scotia. I know it's been seen in some eastern states. But butterfly weed, uh, tuberosa for sure, is in Nova Scotia in lots of gardens. So I haven't I thought seen that, that other variety yet. Okay. And so butterfly weed, is it invasive because like common milkweed, it spreads via rhizome? So, uh, so butterfly weed is so far not invasive. It's just people like putting it in their gardens. So it's less common and it's uh, the butterflies don't like it as much according to studies. Oh. Common milkweed is a bit more aggressive because of the rhizomes. Oh, okay. All right. So it's not necessarily a problem for your garden, but the butterflies aren't maybe going to use it as much. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Oh, interesting. All right. uh, Brooke's got a question about migration. When it comes to migration, how does that final generation know where to go in Mexico? Which is a super good question. Oh, uh, that's a good question. I don't know if I've actually read that anywhere to figure it out. I um, cause I'm not sure if it's actually by smell, if they smell their way there, or if it's one of those environmental cues where they like follow the coast down and, and head towards the climate that they like. So I'm honestly not entirely sure how they find that specific spot. <laughs> I would assume because they're good, they go by visual cues too. So they're not huge smellers. So I, I'm thinking it's like not quite salmon-y, but more or less they, they kind of know. <laughs> Like the birds just know. <laughs> okay, cool. It's impressive, however they're doing it. Um, is it true that um, we we have a friend, uh, Dr. Heather Cray at Dalhousie, who um, is really into moths and told me that um, unlike butterflies, moths will take themselves right up into the jet stream and just get, I think she said yeeted to their migration area, whereas butterflies, she said, uh, fly all the way like a chump. Is that the <laughs> case? Are they... Um, manually moving themselves <laughs> more so than um, being carried. So they are actually deciding where to go. Oh, I love that. Uh, monarchs are more gliders than flyers. So they, they take advantage of the wind. So they'll actually go along the coast a little bit and travel and they'll use that wind to help them get down there. But on the way up, they're flying. <laughs> on the way down, they're gliding more, as if I understand correctly. <laughs> okay, all right, cool. What? Super impressive. Um, I have some questions about monarch physiology. Um, I, I, this might not be your background, I'm not sure, but our, um, our Young Naturalist Club, the Nature Guardians chapter, before um, the monarch was red listed and we needed a permit to do these kinds of things, we were raising a small number of monarchs from a patch in um, a uh, swamp milkweed in Dartmouth that we had planted. And we thought we were having unusually high predation due to the large number of pheasants that were there. We thought maybe the pheasants were being fed by people. And so they were hanging out there and we were losing a lot of caterpillars. Anyway, so we kept, um, I think 10 or 12 caterpillars in uh, an outdoor enclosure and then got to watch them grow and leave. And that was awesome for the kids. But um, we had one caterpillar who was normal as a caterpillar and it being a female, um, we learned when she turned into a butterfly. Um, but when she made her chrysalis, she um, the seam in the front or back, depending on how you would organize a caterpillar body, I guess, where um, the legs end up forming, she had like a weird um, deformation there that when she emerged from her chrysalis ended up resulting in her proboscis and her two front legs being fused together. And so we had a huge discussion about that in our youth group because, you know, we had raised these animals and we felt responsible for them. And, and there's an ethical question there too, about what to do with this animal that might not survive. And so we discussed um, the animal's ability to eat or not. And if we were okay letting an animal go that might starve to death versus like euthanizing them on the spot kind of thing. And so that prompted a whole bunch of research. Anyway, I found one paper about proboscis injuries and the likelihood of survival. And we ended up performing a tiny surgery on the butterfly where we snipped the proboscis at the legs to free all three uh, appendages. And the butterfly survived. We kept him for, for, for two days 
to make sure she was eating. And then she took off. So I was really shocked by that. I had assumed that they were a little bit more delicate, especially if they were coming out of their chrysalis right away with an issue. And I'm still not totally comfortable around the ethics of the whole situation. But I'm just wondering if you have any knowledge or thoughts around what what is it that really kills monarchs? So probably so many monarchs die before they actually make it to their next stage in long migration. How many monarchs are surviving to reproducing? And what are the main things that are taking those lives? Right. Um, so very few make it from egg to adult. And predation is really high at the, at the uh, egg stage and caterpillar stage, actually. So um, a lot of those predations are things like other insect or insect predators. So like wasps and things will predate those uh, spine soldier beetles will predate caterpillars and like a spine soldier beetle larva, which is only the size of like uh, an eraser on a pencil can predate a full size fifth instar caterpillar that is a hundred times its size. Um, and birds and things will predate on the caterpillars as well. So like there's a huge mortality rate of caterpillars at that stage. So it's not surprising that the predation rates are high and that's why they lay so many eggs and things is like they're trying to flood as many as possible. So uh, and get adults from that. Um, yeah, so I say it's mostly like insect predators, even and that that varies year to year. Like some years you'll have really high predator predator rates, and re and then other years you might not. Uh, in particular, last year there was a, a particularly warm spring at one point, and it caused the ladybug population to boom. And so there was ladybug larvae everywhere, and they ran out of food, so they started eating all the the monarch eggs. So there's no eggs. Ever. like there was a huge patch I searched the entire thing and I couldn't find a single egg and I talked to a local and he said that he had zero eggs because of all the ladybug larvae so stuff like that happens so you'll have these fluctuations in population size which is normal hmm, interesting and in terms of like injuries I imagine being a tiny winged insect you probably get beaten up quite a bit on your migration and then there are the monarchs, like um, I think we called her Juanita, the one that had the proboscis issue. Um, what are what are their outcomes like if they get really beaten up? If they manage to make it to the next milkweed patch, are they still able to reproduce and then just give it a last ditch effort kind of thing? Or like I guess what I'm wondering is if you see an injured butterfly, are you hopeful that it's going to make it, or is it like a sad situation? Like oh, that one's not going to reproduce. <laughs> I think they do pretty pretty good. Um, you see quite a few uh, in the fall or spring, I guess. Uh, once they get done, they're overwintering. Those butterflies are like really old, like they're already six months old by that point, and they look they look extremely tethered. Like their wings are pretty fit, frayed because they've lived so long and they've traveled so far and they've overwintered, and they still keep chugging so like I think they're pretty strong and hardy little insect despite being so delicate they're actually they survive a lot yeah. that makes me feel so good they seem so plucky <laughs> uh, Kathy says she was uh, surprised to hear about the unusual egg per plant ratio um, she had eight caterpillars last year on a Cinderella swamp milkweed which had the pink flowers and they ate everything and she couldn't get more plants until August and I, I feel you Kathy because I've had the exact same problem. <laughs> um, the plant is back and three more plants have been acquired now but um, I wonder if you have any thoughts about that kind of situation where you like you know you have a bunch of caterpillars and you're running out of milkweed and what what do you do? I know that's the that's the hardest part right now is figuring that one out, especially in the fact that they're endangered and you can't move them. Um, it's best to try and get as many plants as you can. Um, the other idea that I had was that because uh, I grew milkweed last year and I was growing it to, for my mother to add to her garden because she didn't have enough plants and I was worried if she got caterpillars, she wouldn't be able to feed them. And I swear I had them outside for one day and a monarch somehow found them and laid eggs on it. And I was like, uh oh, 
So I started planting a bunch of plants inside. And when they ran out of food, I took those plants outside so that in the meantime, while I, I was waiting for them to grow, another monarch didn't come along and start laying more eggs. So having a reserve somewhere tucked away that you can access later and use is also great. Like, or start, have some seeds on hand and plant them once you get some caterpillars and have those growing as a backup and then trade the plants in and out rather than moving the caterpillars. <laughs> Gotcha. Okay. And do you know anything about that permit process? Who's administering the permitting for Monarch projects now? And has that been a significant barrier for you guys and your work? Or are you anticipating that to interfere with research? Um, so that would be the Department of Natural Resources. We have to apply to permits for all our work that we do if we're handling the species. So that's kind of a normal thing for us for especially reptile work. Um, we're not planning on getting a permit for butterflies because we're not planning on touching them. Um, we're just going to go monitor them and keep track of them. So we don't plan to actually deal with that because <laughs> I mean, it's a lot of paperwork. And if we don't need it, we're not going to bother spending an unnecessary time. Right. What about the um, the plants? Are they or are they technically but not in reality covered by the same rules? Like, do you? technically need a permit to be creating a garden or transplanting wild milkweed? Uh, no, it's just the monarchs that are uh, protected by that. It's not the plants. So it, you won't get in trouble for moving the plants without a permit. Well, I can't imagine you'd even get caught, but that's good to know. <laughs> okay, folks, well, if there's no more questions, then we're at eight now, so I'll let Carter go. and. Thank you so much, Carter, for talking to us about butterflies and milkweed and well, all things butterflies. This is great. I'm really excited that I learned something about orange milkweed. I'm going to be really careful about my shopping now. Um, our next Nature Talks, folks, is going to be next month on the first Tuesday, which I think is the, oh, what is it? The, oh, unless it's a holiday, in which case it'll be the second one. But anyway, we'll send out an email. Um, if you're following us on social media, you'll see it there. Um, Carter, I know MTRI also has your presentation series. Is there anything coming up in the near future that folks should be aware of? Uh, I can't remember the next one, but we post them all on Facebook and you can sign up for them ahead of time, just like this one. We're hosted on Zoom and then we post them on YouTube afterwards, the same. Great, okay. Well, thanks so much for being here, everyone. And yeah, definitely head over into MTRI's website. There is a link in the chat there and I'm sure you can also Google them. Yeah, and check out some more presentations. We'll see you next month. Thanks so much, Carter. Thank Have you. Bye, everyone.